Hi, I'm Rob Volpe, CEO and founder of Ignite360, an insights and strategy firm that helps our clients find one big idea to move, drive their business forward. Today on the show, we're gonna talk about the five steps to empathy. I'm gonna walk you through each step to improve your EQ skills and make you a better leader. And I'll share with you what I didn't know about empathy until I saw someone flame broil their deity. Congratulations. You are tuned into Dolph Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives and those who are dedicated to creating a quantum leap in leadership. Your host, Dolph Barron, he's an executive mentor to leaders like you, a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, CEO World, and he's been featured on CNN, Fox, CBS, and many other notable sites. Dolph Barron is an international business speaker who was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers to hire. Now, over to Dolph Barron. Welcome, dear friends, fans, and fellow aficionados of Leadership Excellence. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Leadership and Loyalty, Tips for Executives. Let me ask you, what do you need to do to up-level your leadership? As a leader, you already know that it is vital that you have a line of communication with your people with the people that you serve that is clear and undiluted. However, the role of empathy in communication can make a vast difference to the quality of your communication. But do you and your team truly understand the five steps to being genuinely empathetic? Well, stay tuned because that's where we're going on today's show. I'm your host, Dov Barron, and I'm here to assist you tapping into the one thing in your business that changes everything by transforming meaning into action. Find out more, you can simply go to dovbaron.com. That's D-O-V-B-A-R-O-N.com. This episode of Leadership and Loyalty is brought to you in part by our other podcast, Curiosity Bites. Curiosity Bites is the answer to the question, how can we bring people together who completely disagree? This is exactly what your heart, your soul, your mind have been craving. It's your chance to sit in on some real and oftentimes intense conversations with some of the world's most interesting people. We're talking about astronauts, neuroscientists, philosophers, holy people, quantum physicists, skeptics, entrepreneurs, uh, multi-Grammy award-winning entertainers, and so much more. And oftentimes, people you would think you would completely disagree with, you'll find absolutely fascinating. Simply go to dovebaron.com and find out how you can sign up for and sink your teeth into the delicious Curiosity Bites. As always, you can find both of our podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or wherever it is that you tune into podcasts. And we always need your help in staying relevant. So please go over there, wherever there is, tune uh, to tune in and do us a favor, rate, review, and subscribe to the show. If you are a regular listener, big thank you to you for making us the number one podcast globally for Fortune 500 listeners. We are honored and grateful to be cited by Inc., Dot com is the number one podcast to make you a better leader. You can also listen to us uh, via Google Home and Alexa by simply saying play Dove Baron podcast. Again, thank you for sharing the show with everybody you know. All right, let's strip it down and dive right in. Empathy. For many people in the leadership world, it's become one of those new throwaway words like integrity and uh, innovation. It gets put up on websites, it gets written about in promotional pieces, and yet very few people understand what it really is and how massively powerful a tool it is when it comes to being a more effective leader. But what if you or one of your team is the person in the room who is nodding along, but actually struggling to understand what empathy really is or how to apply it? What if there were an easy to follow five-step mechanism to build empathy now. Well, stay tuned because that's exactly where we're going. My guest today is Rob Volpe. Now, Rob is the CEO and founder of Ignite360. And Ignite360 strategy is a strategy firm helping Fortune 500 companies better connect and understand their customers. Rob uh, um, and Ignite360 work with many brands that you'll know, including Microsoft, 3M, uh, Kraft Heinz, United Airlines, Dyson, Target, Warner Brothers Entertainment, 
Whole Foods and a whole bunch more that you would definitely recognize. Rob is an empathy activist and developed the five steps to empathy, which he frequently writes about and speaks about. He's currently finishing his brand new book, which we'll tell you about as we get into this. But in fact, I will leave it to you to say, tell me more about that. <laughs> and we got into the show. But we'll get there in a minute. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and help me welcome Rob Bobo! Welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dov. It's great to be here. It's a pleasure, mate. I'm honored to have you here. Looking forward to the conversation. So as you know, we always like to start off our show in this wonderful era of every man and his dog being an influencer, every woman and her cat being an influencer, and... I think influencing has a lot more to do with plastic surgery and algorithms than it does to do with anything else. So we asked the real question, who is somebody that we might not know or may not even consider who's been a major influence to you in your leadership? Um, yeah, I love this question. And, and I've been giving that thought, listening as, as a fan of the show, knowing that, okay, first question, here we go. You know, and the, the first thing that comes to my mind is actually it's my dad. Um, dad used to be in the, the Navy um, when I was first born, was in Navy reserves, and he's did a lot um, growing up and even still today to, to show me different leadership skills and, and what it means to be a leader um, and pointed to people in other military heroes. Um, John McCain is one that came to mind that really stood for integrity. Mm -hmm. um, and what it actually means to lead and to take that responsibility and the, the ownership of it. And then, you know, the other sort of, I guess, lesser known people or less obvious people, I, I believe as I reflect on my own leadership style, I don't have, there's no one book that I followed. It's not just my dad. It's, a, it's like so many people that I've met through my life. And there were a lot of bosses and managers that I had early on in my career that really helped me understand not to um, get my knickers in a twist, as, as one would had said to me. Um, oh, very British of you. I love it, that. It, it, and one of my was, favorite sayings. I love that saying. I, mean, I, was bold, I was 20 years old interning at CNN over in London, in their London bureau, and she told me this one time, and I just like, I loved that saying, and it's always stuck with me, and it's just a great philosophy for life. Don't get your knickers in a twist. And so that helps me try to have perspective as I'm leading my teams and, and you know, keep it all, keep it all in perspective and maybe have some empathy uh, with people as well and, and not take all of this so seriously because, you know, at the end of the day, we're just all on a journey together. Um, yeah, that's, that's great insight really is because um, really it's, you know, the, the, the saying, don't get your knickers in a twist, can often be used to minimize what's going on for you. But if you're approaching the world from don't get your knickers in a twist, it, uh, um, subjectively, then you realize that people are going through stuff that you have no understanding of. And, you know, part of my personal philosophy is I have to always remember everybody's trying to feel better about what I don't know, but I guarantee they know there's something that's bugging them. And the reason they're being pissy with me and I want to bite bark back is because of that. So I've got to not get my knickers in a twist and understanding that there's something going on for them that has got their knickers in a twist, but it's probably nothing to do with me. And so I, it's, that's a really great philosophy. You know, yeah. and we we'll definitely have to make a point of noting that in the in, in the uh, in the show notes. So as as we jump into here, obviously this is about empathy, and that's a lot of what you have been focused on um, in your work and even in your development of what you've been doing. <clears throat> but as I said in the beginning, I think that empathy is one of those words. I teach empathy. I teach compassion. And I and I'm never cease to be amazed about how people either misunderstand it or academically understand it. You know, they, they, they can tell you what it is, but they don't get it. So right. from, you know, this has become a specialty area for you. So tell us about empathy, what it actually is to you. What does it really mean to you? Sure. And yes, it's it's a word that everybody's afraid of. 
um, or many people are afraid of, it's, I call it an E word, like emotion. And that <laughs> makes some people nervous. They're yeah. uncomfortable maybe going down into their emotional space. And the way I talk about it, the way I even think about empathy is that, that basic definition of trying to put yourself into somebody else's shoes as them, or to see somebody else's perspective. None of those things have anything to do with emotion. They can, but empathy is this word that uh, several different um, traits have been put to and assigned to the word empathy. Mm -hmm. And so when you start to break empathy down, you know, and, and A, people confuse it with sympathy, first of all. So at the like kind of starting level, empathy and sympathy. And and the way we talk about that is it's the difference between the word with and the word for. You have sympathy for somebody, which creates this power dynamic where you're looking mm -hmm. down. You, I'm so sorry that happened to you. And then empathy, though, is the with. It's seeing somebody as a peer and at, at eye level. But then within empathy itself, there's cognitive empathy. That's all perspective taking in the head. I, I see mm -hmm. where you're coming from. I can imagine how that feels. And then there's the emotional side, which is the feeling. I feel what you're feeling. And there's actually some great work out of um, Stanford, Jamil, Dr. Jamil Zaki's done some work on uh, looking at the brain patterns when you're having... A, emotional empathy versus cognitive empathy. And they actually, apparently it shows up in different parts of your brain. That's so they are actually two slightly different things. And, and so for me, I practically recognized, I said, okay, it, it's hard for people to get in touch with their emotions. Not everybody can do that. Men are from Mars, women are from Venus, all of that. But you should be at least able to take somebody else's perspective and see somebody else's point of view and to have cognitive empathy. And in business, especially, that's what's ultimately important. And so you've seen other books written um, that, you know, go, there's one called Against Empathy. Um, I think Paul Bloom's the author. And he argues that, no, you don't need, you shouldn't be empathetic because that takes you into this place of compassion and acting out of compassion. You're making all your decisions from the heart and not from the head. And what he's actually arguing for is we need to have cognitive empathy and to make decisions using a combination of the head and the heart. Mm -hmm. So again, in the workplace, it's that cognitive empathy. We need to just see the point of view. We need to know where somebody's coming from. Maybe we're going to get to an emotional place, but most often it's just understanding the perspective of what's going on in somebody else's life. How are they, what's, what's showing up for them? And then that helps me understand how to interact with them. Yeah. I thank you for breaking that down into the two distinctions of the cognitive versus the emotional, because I think, as you said, it's the E word. People are afraid of e emotions, particularly in the leadership positions. They're trained to uh, walk away from emotions or turn away from emotions and personally i mean my work is around a lot of my work is around emotional logic and understanding the logic of emotions um, requires empathy but um again i i love that you brought up this because it's important for our listener um because very often that statement comes up is it like sympathy no sympathy is looking down oh you poor dear empathy is lying side by side right uh, and that's vastly different. So, you know, I don't want your sympathy and you'll never get sympathy from me. But I do want your empathy if I'm in pain. And I, and I will always offer you empathy if, I'm, if you're in pain. And, and so I think that that's part of the, the challenge, don't you, Rob, where people are, are afraid that, you know, it becomes a... Uh, I, for me, this is my interpretation, I want to know yours. Um, empathy, uh, sympathy rather validates victimhood mm -hmm. i don't want to ever validate your victimhood because then you're not empowered but my empathy can empower you to do better is that a fair way of understanding it from your point of view yes i think that's a great uh great example and you know it, it's not to say that sympathy doesn't have a role in society it absolutely does you know at the loss of a pet you know, on Facebook, you, you offer your condolences, you offer sympathy in those situations. Yes, that's where it makes sense. But for everything else, it's about taking perspective and understanding yep. somebody else's point of view. Yeah. It, it's so vital. So missing. Um, so when we, uh, 
when we spoke previously, and this is this, I, I want you to stay with me here, listener, uh, viewers, uh, for a moment, because I th you'll see where all this goes. It's kind of very fascinating. When we spoke before, Rob, one of the things you spoke about was, you know, you're talking about this, having this greater understanding of things. And uh, you've had a very interesting journey. And we can talk a little bit about that journey in a minute. But in that journey, we spoke about, you were telling me about going into people's homes across the US and you were telling me about being in the dirtiest house in America. Tell us a little bit about that because it ties in and I want people to sort of grasp it. Yeah, uh, so uh, what we do at Ignite 360 is an insights and strategy firm. There's a lot of qualitative research. So you have to actually talk to people to understand how they feel or how they think about things and to have empathy with them. Uh, so yeah, early on in my career, I went into a, a home in um, Atlanta, Georgia suburbs. It was uh, a project on bubble gum. So we're talking to teenagers and it was like late June in Atlanta, Georgia. So that means 95. Nice yeah, nice and warm and sticky. And I, I live in California for a reason. I don't do sticky. So I um, Go, go to this house and the mom doesn't let us in the house. She keeps us outside um, and is like, oh no, go to this picnic table and you can do the interview over there. That was, it's actually the only time that's ever happened in my career. So there was definitely something, something was up. We go and do it. We're all kind of melting. Finally, the parents leave to go get dinner and the uh, teenager we'd been talking to, he had been talking about some YouTube videos that he produced and was putting up online. And we were like, oh, well, that could get us inside in the air conditioning if he were to show us what you know is, is that's all about. And we went into the home and walking into it, I've never been in a hoarder house before. And, and back then it was before the, the TV show and everything. Right. So I didn't totally understand it, but that's exactly what it was. And because we were in Atlanta, there was all sorts of Coca-Cola memorabilia on the walls, piles of papers, like a very thin path through the living room, got into the dining area. The dining room table was piled with, uh, you know, I think a tire from a bicycle, a computer printer, all sorts of random this or that. Turn to the, the right, look in the kitchen, you can see a um, mound of dishes. And then there's this cake um, sitting in a, a Pyrex dish that's fresh out of the oven and the house kind of has, you can tell that somebody, the mom baked a cake or somebody baked a cake. And then you see the cockroach crawling around. And then you see in the bathroom, like the litter box and the toilet and the filth and even more filth. And you're like, oh my God, what, where are we? What is going on? And you're, you're, you know, I'm trying to have an interview with this kid and the teenager, he was like 18. And he, you know, it, it, it was, it was hard for me because I didn't totally understand empathy and how to get there. Right. But had to work really hard to go, this isn't about me. This isn't about my judgment. This is his life. It's how he lives. I have to honor that and try to understand where he's coming from and help my clients. Cause I have, of course had, you know, somebody from the ad agency and then somebody from yep. the marketing team with me help them understand and and stay focused on let's let's listen to what he had to say not get lost in all the judgment the smell of cat urine mixed with um you know betty crocker um <laughs> you know and the judgment that comes along with that sure so yeah i mean that was a really early moment where um and as i write about in the book like i needed to have even more empathy my empathy skill i i mean intuitively empathetic, but I didn't understand the skills and the steps enough. I hadn't developed them and really analyzed and thought about it to get there. But, you know, you're in, instinctively like, oh shit, we've got to, you know, rehabilitate this person. I don't, he had great stuff to say. I don't want to lose all of that just because we're having judgment about the, the condition that he grew up in. And that had nothing to do with him. It wasn't his no. choice. No, it wasn't his choice. So but that the, I, I, the reason I love that story is because empathy, real empathy, you know, we, we, we tend to think, well, you know, 
uh, I've gone through something like that, so therefore I can empathize. And, and yes, of course you can empathize in that situation, but can you empathize with something that has nothing to do with you? If you don't live in a hoarder house with cockroaches and Betty Crocker and all kinds of cat urine and whatever else it might be, and still have empathy for the person in the environment, that's the, the challenge, you know, and you and I talked about before, I said, you know, um, one of the, one of the ways that I will teach empathy is I'll say, okay, you remember that re Republican um, uh, congressman who was, you know, trying to ban all the gay things and he was, you know, saying all these terrible things about gay people and it was an abomination and, the, and people say, yeah. And I say, and do you remember that he evolved and they go, what do you mean? He changed his mind about it all. And they said, yeah, I think that's bullshit. And I said, it's not. And they go, what do you mean? It's not. He did evolve. How did he evolve then? He yeah. found out his son was gay. Once his son was gay, it was real for him. And suddenly he could understand that it wasn't the devil's doing or whatever it was. And it's that moment of allowing it to be real for you, whether you are watching uh, famine porn on TV where the flies are all over the person's face and you can kind of dismiss that. If I pick you up and put you there, you know, for a day, it's suddenly very real and you're going to be the voice of those people. And, it, and suddenly being in a situation, having, and this is what's very interesting, because what you did was you had complete empathy for that individual still fully aware of your judgments. And I think that that's where people make the mistake. They say, if I'm empathetic, I can't be judgmental. And what I always say to them is, let me give you a newsflash. You're a judgmental bastard. Absolutely. So am I, we all are. That's in our makeup, it's allowed us to survive. Whether you act out of that judgment, that's a distinction between whether you're gonna be empathetic or you're gonna be a dick. Be empathetic, sure, and go, okay, I don't understand this, but I don't have to judge it either. And I, that's why I love the way you explained that story, because I wanted people to grasp. It's not about saying they're there, that poor dear, or let's try and fix it, or I've had that experience. No, this is, I can understand this is your reality. Yep, exactly. So I really appreciate that story. Thank you. Yeah, no, and I love the way you elaborated on that. And it is... It's easier to have empathy if you can, if you have that situation, if you have something that you've related to. Um, but it really does require imagination to get into an empathetic um, place. And just even for perspective taking, you just have to imagine what it would be like. And and that is not easy for everybody. Um, the, the, you know, you, you brought up judgment. Um, and it, judgment is the step number one, dismantle your judgment. And it is the biggest barrier for everybody. We spend more time when we're training people on how to go through the five steps and how to get to empathy. We spend more time on judgment than anything else. And judgment actually keeps showing up in the later steps cool. um, in the process. So you've got to be constantly aware of it. I had one uh, situation a few years ago We'd gone into uh, somebody's house, a client was with us. We'd walked him through the five steps, gave him some of that training ahead of time. He joined me on this in-home and the we were uh, talking to folks that shop at convenience stores and it was in the Pennsylvania, Philadelphia area. So Wawa was the, the big one. And the respondent, the guy was telling us about a story about how his brother um, would go to Wawa, buy a whole pizza to take home to feed his family, but he would buy a second pizza to eat it on the way home. So he would eat one pizza while then his family, you know, and then they'd have pizza as a family for dinner. And again, you, you said, I mean, your eyes went wide when you heard that there's judgment that just jumps up. You're like, that's a lot of pizza. And you start mm -hmm. to go into all the places of judgment about of like, who is this person? Yeah. And the client, we left the, the interview and the client turned to me as we were getting into the car to, to head on to our next stop. And the client turns to me and says, wow, I had a lot of judgment about that moment and what he was saying about the brother eating the, the second pizza. But then I realized I was having judgment and I was able to dismantle it. I was able to just push it down, put it aside, and then I could actually hear 
what was going on. And that's the thing. We, we are so quick to judge and, and, and be judgmental uh, in our society. And, and it's just gotten worse and worse and worse when, you know, what do we do on social media? We're judging people. Are I going to give them a thumbs up? What's the emoticon I'm going to give them? You know, it's all judgment. And instead of just listening and hearing and, and putting all of that aside. Yeah. And, you know, so for me in, in our work, um, and I think this is going to correspond very well, maybe, um, is uh, where I am a warrior against um, political correctness. I'm a warrior against this, the politically correct woke cancel culture. It, it, and by the way, I'm certainly more left than I am right. <laughs> but I'm, that stuff, it drives me insane because it's exactly what you were just talking about. What's context? Context has been erased. It's been erased. So if I go, okay, here's a no context story. A guy buys pizza for his family, but he buys two pizzas so he can eat one on the way home. Okay, what's the judgment? I ask you listening right now, what's the judgment? Fat bastard, greasy bastard, you know, uh, you know, whatever it is, right? You're making all those things. But now I give you context. What's the, and I'm not saying this is that guy's context, of course. No, I no, no. Know. But I then give you this context. And the context is that this, this guy grew up his entire life living on scraps of food because he was so damn poor that he knew that if he didn't shovel it in first, somebody else was going to get it because he was the runt of the litter of a big family. So now psychologically, he is trained to eat first, not last. So that's no longer being greedy. It's a survival driving context. Oh, now you can have empathy, right? Yes, that's what empathy is. It's, 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 and sometimes you have to imagine context that, that you don't know in order to give that person room to show themselves in ways that beyond your judgment. Is that, yeah. is that a good way of putting it from your That's, point of view? It's a great description. I have actually heard that from people from large families and what happens at the dinner table when they were a kid. And it was every man for himself because mom only made so much mashed potatoes. And if you want it, you got to get in there and get it. So yeah, that, that is exactly it. And you have to consider the context. You have to, you have to ask good questions, which is the second step. Right. It's like, you, you know, you got to realize you've got judgment. And, and I do want to say too, around the judgment piece, like empathy, judgment has different meanings and, and definitions. I'm not talking about making a judgment in terms of getting to a decision or deciding not to walk down a dark alley. This is all about being judgmental, yes. casting aspersion at somebody, which is everything that you just said about that greasy fat bastard. And, and who is that person? That's all aspersion. Of course. Get rid of that. So then you've got to ask good questions. And asking good questions, you can't, um, you, you, good questions are open questions. They're not closed. So you can't answer it in a yes or a no. And you want to keep it open in a way that they can take you wherever they need to go with their story. Mm -hmm. So you're not asking about, you know, what, well, first of all, you never use the word why. Why is, and I was, I, I, I will give a shout out to the woman, Naomi Henderson, who trained me to moderate, like that three-day course was all about not using the word why, but still understanding why. Mm -hmm. And you can use who, what, where, when, and how to get to the why. So you can ask, well, what, what, what prompts your brother to, what, what's your brother said to you about having that second pizza? Mm -hmm. Um, have you been with him? Well, how did that feel when you were, you were with him? What do you recall? All sorts of ways that you can get at the why, but you've got to ask good exploratory open questions without, you know, I, I always use the example in the courtroom dramas where they claim, oh, objection, leading the witness. Um, you know, you don't want to lead somebody to the answer that you want to hear. You want to be really open to what they're going to, they're going to tell you. Um, so it's asking good questions. And even I, I found, and particularly during the pandemic, we got so busy and caught up in what was happening to ourselves. And you know, you jump on calls with colleagues or clients, and people weren't taking the time to just say, "How are you?" 
and just ask that question and listen to the answer. Hear what people have to say mm-hmm. and get people to open up. And how are you? It's not about how are you doing with the pandemic? How are you doing with, because, you know, and as we saw this year, there was a whole lot of crap going on in our society. And, you know, the the murder of George Floyd and the protests that erupted after that had more impact on some people than the pandemic did. Oh, um, absolutely. The and, politics. And, and we should know, due to empathy, some of the people that had the greatest impact on were not Black. Yeah, exactly. There were actually white people who suddenly went, oh my God, I'm blind to this. I've been completely ignorant. Now I can't be. You know, so, and, and then they, you know, they're feeling their own guilt and their own trauma from this situation. So yeah, you're absolutely right. And they need to you know, get those skills to get the empathy to understand what it might feel like. Um, and, you know, and in those situations, reading is what is, you know, recommended because reading, reading a book helps you go into somebody else's life, whether it's a biography a nonfiction or it's, it's made up fiction. Like it, sure. books are a tremendous empathy builder. Um, so yeah, so asking good questions, super critical. And then it's that actively listening, um, is the third step. And, you know, yes, you hear, listen, you think ears, but it's really using all of your senses. And I talk about using all six of your senses because I consider intuition as a sense that we, it's critical. You know, it's that voice inside you that's telling you, cueing you, there's something else here, something's not, you know, I'm sensing there's something else going on. Go here, explore this, explore that. Um, But you've got to actually tune in and be present. And I think that's another challenge that we've had in society that's gotten worse and worse is actually just being present and being in the moment. So that third step, so you got your first step, which is dismantling the judgment. Once you've learned how that there's a difference between judgmental and judgment, then you've got to open, ask these open-ended questions, the, avoiding the why, which leads to justification most often for people exactly. rather than truth. Um, and then in that third step, I'm looking for the practicality for the, for the listener, the viewer. What's the simple practicality of that? It's you're using, you're using your eyes to listen to the nonverbal cues right. to pick up what's going on you're, you know, on an in-home in this case, like I'm always looking at the environment that somebody's in. And I've had some amazing discoveries just from uh, opening my eyes and paying attention to things that they have hanging on the wall that everybody else in the group missed. I I write about it in the book. Um, And when it's one of my favorite experiences ever, because I took a moment to, I was going to the bathroom um, and I'm standing at the toilet doing my business. And I look up, I saw my reflection in the mirror and I thought, okay, there's my reflection, but the mirror seemed a little janky. And I was like, what's going on with this mirror? And I just broadened my, my field of vision. And all of a sudden I noticed that this was a mirror in the shape of an erect male penis with the balls. Exactly. And I had that reaction (laughs) framed in stained glass. Okay. And I had three clients, two clients with me, a videographer. We'd all been in the bathroom several times. The women, though, the clients and the videographer never noticed it or never said anything about it. But because of the way I was standing and paying attention, I didn't go into the bathroom with, uh, okay, I'm just going to go back to being me and check my phone or do whatever. I was still present. I was paying attention to what was going on. I was actively listening yeah, to what was happening. You just said something there that I think is really important that listening is about paying attention and and think about the term we pay attention, right? You've got to give your attention. You've got to pay for it. And, and oftentimes we are trained by social media and other things to not pay attention. I have a long form podcast. I'm very aware that very few people are actually going to sit down and pay attention with earphones on looking out at the sky for that period of time because we're not trained to do that but amazing things happen when you do that i went for a walk with a friend of mine um, on the seawall here in in vancouver canada we were walking past through stanley park and we and we he's like me we're very attentive 
and, I, and we're talking, we're like having this great passionate conversation. I went, whoa, stop. And he goes, what? I go, look at that. And he looks over and he goes, oh my God, yeah. We, we run out into the beach. There is a dead seal with two massive giant eagles pecking wow. away at the dead seal. Yeah. There were literally hundreds of people walking on the seawall. Nobody even noticed. They were in a place in nature to enjoy the nature and then not noticing the nature. So what happens if you do that? I mean, because this is what you're talking about, like paying attention. What happens active listening? What happens if you do that in your business, in your world, in your leadership to listen? Because that's the practicality here. And I love the analogy you give. The practicality is you could look in the mirror at the reflection or you can pull back and go, wow, this is a piece of art or it's something else, but it's not just a little mirror. It's something else. So again, thank you for that clarity. Cause I, again, I want people to, I, I feel like, as I said at the beginning, I feel like empathy is a word that's thrown around and people don't get it. And these steps are really taking people through the practicality of this. So third, third one, actively listening. Thank you. Yes, yes, absolutely. And, and, and this is why I wanted to develop the five steps because, you know, you, you hear in, in pop culture and political commentary, oh, we need more empathy and got to get empathy. And we started hearing our clients exactly that eye yep. roll. I love it. Yeah, um, that's what it is. We started hearing our clients be like, oh, we got to, the way I say it, it's like, oh, we got to go get me some empathy. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bucket. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's like, but, how, how do you, how do you do that? And, and because empathy is something, you know, humans are, and I think most species actually are, but they've identified seven um, mammals that are able to have empathy and humans are one of them. So it's something that we're born with, but similarly, like, how do you learn how to see? You just kind of start doing it and you figure it out or, or lifting something with your arms our empathy muscle is atrophied in society. Mm -hmm. So we've got to start working it out and we've got to know what to do. You need to know the proper technique before you do a squat or else you're gonna really screw some stuff up. So mm -hmm. that's why, and I've always been, it's always been important to me with the practical, the how to, how do you actually do this and providing you know, my clients, our listeners, with news you can use, the things you can actually apply. So that's where the, the, the purpose for the five steps came from. We wanted to help them understand that and it, it's been working. Um, and, and yeah, so active listening is that third step. And then you get into actually integrating into understanding. So now you've like taken this in and now you're having to process it. And this is where judgment really starts to come back in because you want to be like, no, 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 get out of here. Um, but the way I talk about it is like, it's just making a little room in your head to recognize that, oh, there might be another way of living or doing something that is not wrong. It's just another person's way of doing something. And you've got to make that room and integrate into just understanding that it doesn't mean you have to sacrifice your own belief systems, your own values, but just know that, Hey, there's, there's another way of thinking about this. So step four is integration and processing. Integrate into understanding, but yes, it's Integra about integrating okay. processing to get to a place of understanding. Right. Um, so where do people, but I mean, you said that they, they bump, the wall they bang into is the judgment comes up again. So how do they get the judgment out of the way this time? Cause you're saying integration, which again is going to have an automatic to it, which means, okay, well, I got to judge it to understand it. Well, yeah. And so are you being, that's judgmental right? <laughs> um, versus being a, casting aspersion on it. Right. Um, because you do ultimately need to go through the decision-making process yep. and consider it, but are your biases or your stereotypes or your past experiences getting in the way? Right. Those are the things you need to watch out for and, and recognize it. And it's, it's hard for some people, depending on, you know, where you fall on Myers-Briggs, um, your own past, the, the wounds that you're dealing with, like all sorts of things can get triggered. 
but you need to do the work. You have to, to start to face that and understand like, yes, I'm being judgmental about this. Mm -hmm. um, and here's why I had a past experience. I had a boss that treated me this way. And so therefore I feel like that's the way I'm supposed to do this. Or yeah. I always had to do it that way for that boss. And I expect the same thing from you. And that's all just judgment. Mm -hmm. And it, it's blocking versus hearing, you know, an employee come to you and say, I need to do this a certain way, or here's my rationale, here's my thinking. And if you're actually listening, actively listening, you've asked some good questions, understand where they're coming from, you should be able to at least say, okay, I could put my pants on with the left leg first, or I could do it with the right leg first. Like there's, there's multiple ways of doing things. I can approach analysis for a report in multiple different fashions. Mm -hmm is one right or wrong, we can debate that and we can have that conversation, but it's about respecting and understanding that there is another way of doing something. Mm -hmm. So now the leader has sat down, they, they've learned how to, well, they're beginning to learn, I mean, of course, you're laying this out in the book, they're beginning to learn how to dismantle their judgment, they're asking better open-ended questions. Um, and then from there, they're actively listening, which really means paying a greater level of attention to not just the words, but potentially the intonation, the cadence, and the environment. Mm -hmm. You know, as a, a, a very good friend of mine, Mark, who is one of the leading body language guys in the world. And he says, the problem with body language experts is they're looking at everybody's body. And he teaches, like he works with the G6 leaders, uh -huh. right? And he says, when I do the body language guidance with them, he goes, I set the room. He goes, I set the room. Yeah. He, and so, you know, he, he shows this image of Joe Biden, but behind him is the flag in the triangle. He goes, that's not there by mistake. Right, exactly. That's been positioned. That's the body language of the environment that's yep. set. And by you stepping back from that mirror, it was exactly what you were doing is that same thing. And then uh, you, you, and then from on from there is to start to integrate having judgment, but not being judgmental, working it out, which takes us into our fifth step. Yes, which is using solution imagination, as I call it, which is the actual now stepping into their shoes and and imagining the world from their point of view or, or whatever the topic is it doesn't have to be the whole world mm -hmm. um but yeah it's it's stepping in and again judgment can keep cropping up and and get in your way and make those shoes pinch and you need to <laughs> you need to stretch it out get rid of the judgment so that the shoes will fit and and will be comfortable but it's, so it's ultimately... better than that suit of mine that I told you about before we started recording. <laughs> exactly. Well, if they've dismantled judgment, I promise they will. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Just like an action, but Dom, in that story you told me, there was judgment. Of course, in there. Was. Of course they, there was. They were like, no, there's no way somebody has those measurements. So we're going to cut the suit like this. And you yeah. got, you know, Some a suit that was ill-fitting exactly and, and that's, that, that's a very very courteous way to put it <laughs> how very non-judgmental of you <laughs> i'm not perfect but i try <laughs> yeah, that's good. um but yeah you 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 know this is the moment and the stories that i talk about in the book um actually revolve around really then this is getting into empathy this is imagining what it's like to be somebody else and i tell a story we did a project on immigrants coming to canada and uh a woman who I interviewed she uh came from india and you know she was a teacher in india her husband was a civil engineer but the way things work you don't get to just slot into that same career mm -hmm. so she found a job at burger king mm -hmm. and she was working on the line on the, the the cook line yep and she was talking and earlier she had talked about how you know they don't eat beef and but her she's got a son and so they're letting him kind of find his own way um with their, their guidance and it just clicked in my head and i used my imagination like okay if i were hindu and i had the cow as a sacred 
deity and and um, in my religion, and I suddenly had a job where I had to flame broil that deity, your holy cow, my holy cow, mm -hmm. like holy cow. What would that mm -hmm. feel like? Yeah. What would that be like? And so I asked her. And she told a really powerful story about, you know, the first day she came home and the tears that she had because of what she had to do. And there were other employees that were also of South Asian descent. And they were, you know, they talked about how they cope and, and deal with that. And, you know, I remember in particular, she talked about how sometimes the grease would get up on your lips, you know, you would just kind of splatter. And so, you know, you'd get on her lips and that's almost, you know, she had to be very careful because she did not want to be consuming it um, and how, how painful that was. And, and so I was able to use solution imagination to unlock all of that, but also to connect into the sacrifice that immigrants make when they're coming into this country, the things they are willing to do in, their, in this uh, family's case for a better life for their son for better opportunities and the things that they're they're actually able to do. And so that's an example of using solution imagination to further that conversation, but just to understand it just unlocked so much for me about the, the immigrant population. That is, uh, that is fascinating. And I, you know, I wish, <clears throat> I wish we could develop a heck of a lot more national empathy around immigrants, um, uh, particularly in the United States, which is a country of immigrants. Um, it, which it's, is it's insane a... to me that people could be that way. Um, and, and as I often will say is, you know, you say I'm an American because you were born here. And meanwhile, people are saying to one of my clients um, who is of Japanese descent, um, she was down South and somebody said to her, uh, where are you from? And she said, California. And she goes, no, no, where are you from? And she goes, California. She goes, well, how long have you been here? She goes, since Tuesday. She goes, oh, my goodness, your English is really good. She goes, why wouldn't it be? I was born here. Really, honey? Right? You know, yeah. she's fifth generation American, but she doesn't look like what you have. And what you have in your mind is an American is this, but you forgot that, you know, there used to be signs that say no Irish, right? Exactly. Which is about as white as you can get. I, my, I'm, I'm very fortunate. I have a, a grandmother uh, that's 102. And wow. she, yes, and still with it. And she will talk about, grew up in New York City. And, yep. you know, she talks about, she was German, um, but my grandfather was Italian. But she talks about, and the way she talks about the subsequent immigrant communities that came in and you know it went from i don't know the exact order but let's say the the germans to the irish to the italians and then it went into like the puerto ricans and then the dominicans and you just you continue to see the immigrant journey continue in this country and it is what the country's founded on I, it drives me insane when people are like oh i'm the american you got to get out of here it's like no we're all you know yeah. i'm third generation and yeah, it, it, there's a, I'm trying to remember his name, I've forgotten his name right now, but he's an American comedian from New York, from the Bronx, who does the history of New York. And he does it as an immigrant story. And he goes up through each of the, you know, so the Chinese coming in, the Irish coming in, the Germans coming in, the German Jews coming in, you know, and, and goes through all these times, all these people. And it is absolutely fantastic, because he also shows how the New York language has changed. That they mm. took a little bit of this Italian, or they said a little bit of this German word, and and how the Yiddish is now kind of New York language. Right, right. absolutely. <laughs> like lots lots of my non-Jewish friends understand what I say when I say something in Yiddish. They're like, of course, <laughs> and and <laughs> yeah. it's that you know it's this wonderful understanding. And again, we all fall apart on empathy uh, when we get tribal. And, and yeah. the, we can't afford the tribalism on any side, left or right, um, if we're going to hold on to empathy. And, you know, step three here is about, um, not step three, step two was about asking great questions, which, of course, is the title of your upcoming book, one of the greatest and most important questions in the process of empathy, which is? 
Tell me more about that. Tell me more about that. We want to say we, we, so I've seen people say, you know, uh, they think they're being empathetic when they, when somebody tells us them, and then they say, Oh yeah, I've had something similar and then steal the whole light. Like, Oh, I, I, yeah, my mother died too. I wasn't talking about your mother. Shut up and listen to me. Right? Absolutely. And so what you, that the title of your book is, is important to that. Tell me more about that. Yeah, it, it because in that example that you gave, and, and we all default to that, you think like, oh, yeah, I want to show you that I've got empathy with it. But no, you really need to take the time to help that person unpack whatever they're going through or, or that experience, the topic. You know, it's, it's never just ask. The first question is fine. The second question is where it really starts to get interesting. And the, mm. for me, the second question is usually tell me more about that after they, they've given me an answer. And that's when they unpack, you know, tell me more about, you know, what it was like working at Burger King and having to flame broil your deity. You know, how many Americans, Americans would be willing to flame broil, you know, Jesus, can you do that? No, <laughs> but what, you know, that's what it's kind of the equivalent. I hope, that, I hope that that's a chapter title, flame broiling the deity. <laughs> Cause if it's not, it damn well should be. And what's more, is that that's a fantastic article which you can put up in Dragon's Den. I would love to share that one. I would be happy to do that. Done. Flame Done. broiled deity. Flame right? broiled deity. And I an immigrant story. That yes. is a powerful, powerful title. Right? Because it this is what we don't understand. You know, we 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 think we see everything through our own lens and we miss so much of what's going on. You know. Uh, Rob, we're already, can you believe we're already close to the end of the show? <laughs> we're already close towards the end of the show. And what I want to ask you, because it, uh, for, for the, the context of the show, is what are some of the most common mistakes leaders make uh, when they're applying or trying to apply empathy to team, to the people they work with, and to the potential consumer, the buyer of their product? Because I feel like, again, it becomes sort of generic. There's like, oh, you do this and you do that. And they think they've done it. And I feel like, oh, my God, you've so missed it. What are the most common mistakes that you see? Well, I think first that, you know, they, they feel like, oh, this is just an exercise that I can do one afternoon and check the box and I'm done. No, this is a this is a lifestyle change. This is constant work and evolution, just like you would do with anything when you're trying to change and modify your behavior. So, you know, and, and judgment is the thing that really gets into people's way. So you've got to constantly be thinking about it. Um, and the five steps to empathy, and I don't use a lot of business examples in the book because they're human stories and they're human exactly. experiences and empathy is a human condition that you use in your work life and in your business life. But it's learning how to apply both of those. Um, you know, where do people get into trouble? Judgment, 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 just constant, constant, constant thing. Biggest struggle for people, they are always coming back to it. We're always hammering that one. Um, paying attention. I, I, I love that investment that you're making in your team or in your consumer, you're paying attention, you're actively listening to them and being present. Um, I'm fascinated to see as we emerge from the pandemic, how society does change because there is what we're seeing in some of our other work, tracking kind of shifts in values and behaviors. We're seeing the strong desire for change and to be more present people you know we've we've had to we've been able to sit and meditate or reflect on the past year and they're wondering like okay well is this really worth it what am i what am i doing i really want to make connections that's a really huge theme connecting with the quality people and that's about stripping out some of the other things so that you can actually pay attention and make that investment and I think thinking about it like that as an investment of your time, of your effort, of your energy. Um, those are probably the two biggest things that, that come up. So it's the judgment and not actually listening, not actually paying attention and being present um, and constantly coming back to that. And I would say 
it's those two things that get in the way, whether you're talking to your team or you're talking to the consumer. I think when you're talking to your consumer, customer, client, whatever you want to call it, that, that other person that's going to buy your product, you do need to work harder though on the integrating into understanding, like making sense of all of this. I've seen so many clients, you know, our client, you mentioned some of our clients, they're amazing and I'm really grateful and fortunate for them. Um, but they're also all very well educated, very well compensated. They're living a very different life than mainstream America that might actually be buying their product or using their yeah. services. So you've got even more work to overcome your own judgment and also just integrate into your understanding to, to understand I, years ago, I remember being in meetings at General Mills, they were having, you know, they make YoPlay yogurt, mm -hmm. good product, 55 cents, 60 cents a cup. They were having trouble though, understanding because this Greek yogurt thing had come in and was disrupting the entire category and people were willingly spending $1.25 for a Chobani or a Faye. And I remember a business unit director saying, I don't understand why somebody would pay $1.25 for a cup of yogurt when they could get it for 55 cents, even though everybody in their office was walking around with a oh, cup of Chobani. Exactly. And it's like, okay, we got to like, let's break this down. And, and it's that integrating into understanding and trying to get to that point of using solution imagination. So even though they might've done, we, we'd done research, we were there presenting, we were immersing them in the learning and the consumer they still couldn't integrate it into their understanding. They couldn't make sense of it because their judgment kept getting in the way. But that is, that is the, what I call the psychological language barrier, right? It's like you're talking a different language and it becomes a psychological language barrier and you have to learn that new language. That's part of what empathy requires. I need to learn the language of the person who is speaking and it's on me not on them. It's on me to learn their language and to pay attention to what that is. Um, because yeah, as I said earlier, we're all going to judge. That's inevitable, but you don't have to be a judgmental bastard. You can take that step back and, and a quote unquote, not get your knickers in a twist about it and understand that it's not really about you. It's somebody else's context. And, and how can I ease this person's pain? Because I do a lot of stuff around the psychology of, of marketing and, and purchasing and those kinds of things. And I'm saying like, if, this, if, the, if the person can't, if you don't understand the person's pain that you're selling to, you're not selling them anything. They're not buying it. Doesn't matter what it is. And, and, and it's that, can you step into that? And not from a head case level, Right. It's not, it's, yeah. And often it isn't the deep psychology. It's understanding, it's having perspective, understanding who right. they are, what their lived experience is. Right. What is it just like to be in their life for a day is very, very powerful. I can't remember who did it, but years ago, somebody did it and they put the makeup on and they did a fat suit and walked around because this person realized, the famous person would realize that they were extremely judgmental about people's weight. Yeah. And so the challenge was they put on a fat suit with the makeup and all the rest of it and watch what happened. Dustin Hoffman talked about it when he did, uh, what was that movie where he played a woman? Rain Man. Oh, uh, where he played a woman? Mm -hmm. about... Dustin. Yeah. Oh, Tootsie. Tootsie, right? And, he, and I saw an interview with him afterwards and he said, you know, it's one thing for a guy to be dressed as a woman and to watch that he goes but to be a woman who's not attractive yeah right he goes because i'm not a good looking woman right and he said you know and and the understanding not only what it was like to be a woman but to be a woman who wasn't you know in the upper echelon of good looks mm -hmm. that level we we can't do that most of us can't walk around in in a fat suit or makeup or whatever it is looking like you know mrs doubtfire we, but we can allow ourselves to take the time to be open and find out what it's really like for you. Yeah. What is it like for you to be in this place? You know, I, I wrote a piece about uh, with the George Floyd thing. And I said, you know, I don't, I know what it's like to face judgment and bias 
Um, I, and I said, I, I had my nether regions kicked many times uh, by white supremacist skinheads because I was a Jew. I said, but you know what? Nobody knew I was a Jew when I walked in the room. But if I'm black, that's there before I am. Yep. Right? That judgment comes on me before I am. And that is what we, are, we as leaders have got to understand is you are reading your own judgments on the person rather than waiting for the person. And your five steps, which are beautifully done, by the way, I've been teaching empathy for years, which are beautifully done, pr maybe better than most people I've ever seen do it, okay. laid out beautifully so that people can understand you are going, that, that automatic is going to go off. Now what? You don't get to go, oh, I'm sorry. No, no. It's like, what can I do different? Exactly. You have what the, can I do different? You have the opportunity to make a different choice and to do take a different path and behave differently and get to empathy. It's fabulous. So again, please tell our listeners the name of the book because somebody could be listening to this and the book's been number one for three years already. So tell them the name of the book and the subtitle and all those things. A little drop of the seed into the universe there. Awesome. Thank you. Yes. Uh, it is. The book is called, tell me more about that. Um, um, I'm going to say that again. The book is called, tell me more about that. Solving the empathy crisis, one conversation at a time. It is available wherever book, books are sold, bookstores and online audiobooks, et cetera. Um, and then people can always find me through uh, our company website, which is ignite-360.com. The book would obviously be the backslash book. Um, I'm also on Instagram as empathy underscore activist and on LinkedIn, Rob Volpe. And yeah, you can find him on, you can find him on LinkedIn. Um, we will definitely post all of those notes, uh, all of those uh, URLs in the show notes of all the, all the ways that you can reach out to Rob. And I encourage you to do that. Uh, of course, I encourage you to read the book. Um, this is, and again, if you just took those five steps, it would transform your leadership. Rob, it's been an, an honor and a pleasure, my friend. Thank you so much for being with us. Dov, thank you. This has been a wonderful conversation. I really thank you. enjoyed it. I loved it. And again, for you, dear listener, you can remember that you can hang out with other conscious leaders and you can chat about this episode that you've been listening to or any of past episodes by going into our Facebook or LinkedIn groups. Just look for the Leadership and Loyalty podcast because it doesn't matter how successful you are if your employees and your customers don't understand what gives your company meaning you are only working at a fraction of your true capability to find out how you can hire me dov baron as a speaker or as a leadership strategist for yourself or your organization go to dovbaron.com that's d-o-v-b-a-r-o-n.com because unified meaning is the one single monolithic difference between mediocrity and greatness for all individuals and for companies i want to thank you for sharing the show with everybody you know until next time Stay curious, my friends. Stay curious about how you can have way more empathy. How you can walk through each of those five steps by dismantling some of your judgment, having way better questions, really paying attention that when you listen, looking at how you can integrate and understand, and then stepping into how you can use solutions based on imagination. This is a fabulous show for you. I encourage you to listen to it two, three, four times. Take lots of notes and share it with all your friends. Till next time, I'm Dov Barron. I'm here to assist you tapping into your deep greatness to find the meaning and the next level of clarity, focus, purpose, and profit in your business, your life, and your leadership impact. And I am out.